right now. Live? Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media. And we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and Most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Okay. I guess you guys know how to win the prizes, like just easily go back to one of the seven videos that we posted, leave a question there to make Sonia go crazy because we already have like the 1,500 uh, questions, but we're gonna work through it. By we, I mean Sonia and Vanessa, who will deal with it later on. But if you have any question now, you can either ask for the microphone, like hold your hand up, or uh, just post your question in the live stream. Um, this is a special live stream for us from Behind the Mask because we're actually involved in doing uh, the project together with Greg Lecoeur, who is kind of part of the Behind the Mask family. Now you have to admit publicly that this is correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And it was always like, I, I mean, before I even know you, I, n I have seen the photo that you took to become the National Geographic Photographer of the Year 2017. Uh, 16. 16. And this was a photo from the Sardine Run. Um, and when we first spoke about what we could do together, you always said, you know what? I think because I've been there eight times uh, or whatever, the Sardine Run would be a good idea that we could do something together. Oh, of course. Um, and it's a little bit uh, a problem to fit everybody on stage. But Peter is here, Peter Löseke, who was also part of the project. and. The most important guy of the show, Tony, the Viking sitting behind the screen there, was also part of the show. Um, and so it's kind of a, a common effort. And we thought, if we go there for three weeks, we might have a chance. And then um, this is what we brought back. The idea is that we show the film now so that we all know what we're actually talking about. And after that, Greg and I will talk a little bit about some questions uh, there are and what it is or what it takes to actually be there and film it, uh, you know, and to maybe maximize the, you know, the chance to actually get something. We don't want to tell too much about it. We hope you enjoy the film. This is a premiere. It hasn't been online uh, before, so we really hope you enjoy it. There's no guarantees on the sardine run. There are people that come through here and they'll spend maybe two weeks and not even get to see a bait ball. <laughs> Then you get other people that come out here just for a day on the boat and they can see everything that National Geographic has ever filmed. It's all up to Mother Nature. It's up to various conditions that we are not even in tune with as to whether there's going to be action or not. All we have to do is run. How are you doing this morning? Say the word and we'll be gone. The elevator is good. On this road together. And one day we'll Today to become one. 
We don't have to go alone On this road together The tea station is here, yay! <laughs> Every morning it's a good thing to watch the boats go out. It's from a safety point of view, more than anything else. I've been here every morning. It gives me a real comforting thought, very important. Just the amount of marine predators and life that comes about in a condensed area is truly spectacular. You just never know what you're going to come across from one hour to the next. Every day is different. So there are days where it's just the moment you get out there, it's full of life, full of action. You know, your day goes by very quickly. Um, but then you get other days. This is like one meter of ease. You can do nothing with this. You can sit on the boat for hours and end without anything to look at or anything to jump in with. You might think that, oh, you're out there, there's not a bird in sight, there's not a dolphin in sight, and all of a sardine, things just spark, and it can take you completely off guard at times. He does it, but Greg is always ready. Animal, animal. If I smell your scent, I could lose control. Animal, animal. Gonna bite your flesh when I jump your bones. If I smell your scent, I could lose control. Don't let me hurt ya. One of the 
best things you could ever witness is being on a bait ball that contains all the predators. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you get to see something that most people never get to see. Amazing. The sardine run means to me is the greatest marine spectacle you'll ever be able to witness in life. A lot of it is a gamble for the guys that play the game, myself in particular, it's just so addictive. You've got to keep coming, you've got to keep doing it because I'm too scared I'm going to miss out on something that might only be seen once in a lifetime. How does it feel, Flo? Oh, not so good. Uh, I eat too much. Oh. Hey, dude! I was really occupied for like half an hour in the morning. It's not fair. And it's all to your friends! Yeah, sorry, I had to leave the last scene uh, in it. That's okay, you know. of course. This is how it is in the morning, you know, like you want to get ready and then somebody's taking the wetsuit on and <laughs> occupies the only room that we have for like four guys. Okay. Okay, so, Greg, what, like, what is your idea of the Sardin Run in general? Because I think what we see here, we have to say that we've been very, very lucky with the time that we've been there. Yeah, we, I mean, I did an eight, uh, eight, eight time sardine run and every time is very different. Uh, every year I learn more and more and more. Some year was better. But the thing I want to tell about the sardine run is first, uh, you have to think it's like an ocean safari. It's not just looking for bait ball. This is a sardine migration, so all the sardines come along the coast, the wild coast of South Africa, and this attracts all the marine predators. And we were in Port St. John's, and Port St. John's is a place with a beautiful landscape, beautiful people, but for me the more important is there is a big aggregation on marine predators, so you can see dolphins, sharks, whales, um, Cap for seal, penguin, selfish, all the predators are here, even orca and great white. This is like for me the <coughs> bigger animal event on the planet. I did eight times and at the beginning I was a little bit frustrating because I was looking for bait ball. And this happened sometimes. The sardinon was uh, very well known since the BBC, the not geo, uh, they document the event. But since, it changed a lot. Like 10, 15 years ago, you can see a bait ball uh, from, from the hill. Like if you talk with the people living there, they can see the oil on the water. So you know there is action, there is a bait ball. But now, with overfishing, uh, climate change, global warming, and everything, 
it changed a lot. Uh, before, a bed ball was like the size of a building, and now it's more like a room. So it become more and more complicated. But from the two last year, it become better and better and better. And this year, we were super lucky because also we had very good conditions, especially for the visibility. Because you have to know in this place, there is different current. One day is cold water, one day is warmer. And for the sardine, we need cold water. But when it's cold water, uh, it's not, for, it's not the best condition. It's cold, it can be green, it can be blue. Uh, but this time we were like super lucky. So do you think that when people think about a sardine run, that they have too high expectations? Yeah, I think so, because uh, when I spend time here, like when you go at the bar in the evening, you can talk with all the people, you know, it's a very small place. And you can see people a little bit like, not complaining, but frustrating. And, but when you talk with them and, you know, There is like so many places you go, you pay a trip just to go to see like a dolphin, you go another trip to see humpback whales, you go another trip maybe to dive with sharks. And in this place, there is everything together. And people sometimes they forget, they forget how it's amazing to see all these animals together. <laughs> And for me, like the bait ball is like the cherries on the cake. You know, if you get a bait ball, it's phenomenal. It's like the best thing you can see underwater, uh, you know that? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you have to be lucky to, to get this. But also you have to do it properly. Uh, the problem today for the sardine run is there is many boats, many divers, and you have to work with the wildlife. You have to understand, you need to use the right people. And you know, if you have a small bait ball, You can't go like eight, ten people in the water because you break the action of the animals and they lose the attention and they go away. So it's very important to, if one day you go there, you use the right people and you have to adapt with the nature. So you have to be lucky, but also you have to work on it. Yeah, and I think also uh, logistically, it is quite a, a challenging thing because you have to be always ready but you always have a 99% chance of not getting anything. But if, you, if you're not ready all the time, you have a 100% chance of getting any, uh, yeah, nothing, you right? To, so you yeah. always have to be uh, ready. Yeah, there is a, a sentence on the boat when the action is coming is keep ready. You know, the skipper is like, keep ready, keep ready, keep ready. But the problem is like full speed on the water and sometimes, you know, you have like, wave and everything. So you try to put your well bed on, your BC and everything, but you know, it's moving and it's very difficult. And sometimes you arrive, you're ready and nothing. So you have to do it again and again and again. But also it's very important. And I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to Debbie and Rob from uh, Offshore Africa. Uh, it's two people living in Port St. John's. Port St. John's, it's very wild with call it the wild coast, but this place there is like nothing. And they are like very passionate people and they really love what they do. They are super professional. And uh, Rob is uh, for me one of the best skippers in South Africa because he can really read the sea and you have to read the behavior of the burn. Sometimes we, we, we just wait, 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 you know, sometimes you wait one hour, two hours, three hours, nothing happen. And you can see all the boat going one way, going another way, and you, you just sit and wait. So sometimes you're <coughs> like, oh, why, why we don't do something, you know? And these guys put the motor on and he goes one direction because he understands the bird, where they go, and the speed of the bird, the direction of the bird, and he goes faster and faster, and you can see more birds coming, coming on the same way, you know? And everybody goes the same way, and you can see like far away, like, like a cloud of birds and after it's raining bird, I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, I remember uh, one time when we uh, paired up with another boat and there's always kind of a competition, obviously, because the, if you are the first one on the bait ball, you also kind of control and you, you know, the other ones have to stay back a little bit. So it's always a question of who is finding the right bait ball at the right yeah. time. And I remember one time we stand there with another boat and Rob was yeah. talking to another guy and he already saw, you know, in the edge of his eye that something happened there. So he just 
turn the motor on, still talking, and then just like disappeared. <laughs> uh, the other guy didn't know what happened, but we're already <laughs> on the way uh, to get there. Always ready, always ready. I mean, to be always ready is kind of your thing. You know, like in the team, it's always the thing that you uh, don't know how he does it, you know, but he's always <laughs> you ready. Know, you know, when you go eight, eight times in South Africa to try to get a bed ball, and sometimes you miss the bed ball for like one minute, two minutes, uh, I can tell you, you can learn very, very quickly how to be ready very fast. Yeah, it's but not But this is, you know, when you, I mean, this is, yeah, but this we, is are, we are diving. If you are a professional uh, underwater photographer, you have to be like this. It's also teaching us uh, a good lesson that we are not on this <laughs> level, probably. <For> Speaking <laughs> of, this is, um, I would say, one of your most favorite photos. Yeah, one, one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, but this, this one was taken in uh, two, 2016. And uh, it was one of my first bait ball. And it was a very bad year, but uh, with Rob, the skipper, we work and we just saw some dolphin, no birds at the beginning, and just go in the water and you can see the visibility was not so good, but I can see there is a very small bait ball. So I asked to the boat to go away and he gave me my scuba gear and I just go down with the guide and we wait and we can hear the dolphin and you know, the bait ball was just in front of us and he starts hunting. And for me, which, what is very special when you dive with a bait ball, with dolphin and birds, especially the cap gannet, is you can hear the, do the, the sound of the dolphin, but the first in the bait ball is a bird. And they make a big noise, you know, at the surface, big song. And they are super fast, they can see very well from the hair underwater and this is very impressed because you're ready to shoot some action and there is a bird just coming from nowhere in front of your <laughs> camera. <so. coughs> this is what happened here, I was looking for the... And this is the photograph that was awarded by National Geographic. Is that the reason why you became like an official National Geographic photographer? No, I'm n I, I I'm not an uh, official National Geographic photographer. I'm working with them, I'm a contributor. Um, but this photo for me was... Uh, uh, I, I did my career before, and if you know my story, I changed my life like 10 years ago, and I decided to leave my passion about photography and travel and scuba diving. So I, ch I quit everything in France, I changed my life, and I traveled for one year with just my backpack and my camera. <laughs> and after one year, I came back as a photographer, and I start my, start my career. I was working for diving magazine, I'm doing shooting, and I progress, and I won some contests as well. But this one, for me, is very important because this is when I realized, oh, you, uh, you did a good choice to change your life and live your passion and start photography and everything. This, I think this one is from this year, no? Yeah, this one is from this year. Uh, this is a shot I was looking for from a long time. Uh, because each year there is more and more sharks coming. So this is a black tip, oceanic black tip sharks. And uh, Tony knows them very well. <laughs> but this is from this year. But this year we got everything. Like in 15 minutes, we have sharks, dolphins, British whales, birds, uh, and even cormorants. Before it was very rare to see cormorants, and this year was very good. And now, if we talk about a photo like this, for example, did you use a flash on this one? It looks like you used a flash. Yeah, I used a one. flash. Yeah, okay. It's a very stupid question because I know that because we see your flash in our video footage every time. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's why it's difficult to work with photographer and cameraman at the same time. Yeah, but we found a way to take the flash out, so but it's, uh, it's fine. But if you want to take a good photo, especially sergeant run, you need to use a flash. Okay. So is this like a recommendation for everyone who's going there? That if you want to have like a perfect uh, photo that you can it's actually use a flash? It's, it's easier to go diving for the sardinant without flash because you're lighter, you're faster. Um, but in s when you flash, 
the problem is, is the sun. Depend if you are in front of the sun or in back of the sun. The problem is starting when in South Africa, this time of the year, the sun is super strong. So if you, if you don't have the sun in your back, you need to use the, the, the flash and also to freeze the moment, which is very important. Okay, so now this is, is this like people probably don't know if this is free diving or diving. And there's always the question, if you are diving and you go in and out, I would say at least five million times a day, at least it feels like this, and you always have your tank on your back and then you have to be quick in the water and the bait ball is moving at all times and our guide always is a free diving, you know, is free diving. This, by the way, great guy who has a stick in his hand who will always like peek above water and see, you know, what is going on and kind of guiding everybody else is looking at him. So how does it actually work that you are fast enough and light enough to be able to actually be at the right position at the right time in such a mess? You need to be first passion to find the right bait ball. You say the bait ball is moving and you can't go in the water with a bait ball is moving. You can intercept, but you will just take one or two pictures, like just a piece. So you, you have to, to really work and understand and sometimes just follow and wait to find the static bait ball. And after you just jump in, and what happens also is sometimes you fix the bait ball because what like the sardine is also the, they use to come to you to protect from the predator. So sometimes, and I think Peter can say also, we have to swim back because the sardine was coming <coughs> to us. Uh, Pretty yeah. good feeling, actually. Yeah. Pretty weird feeling yeah. also. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because this is very like uh, wildlife. Uh, the, the, for me, the more exciting thing in the sardine run is when you jump in the water, you don't know what is waiting for you. So you can jump and see like 100 sharks with a bait ball, or you can jump and see just four or five dolphins, or you can see a sea lion. I remember in 2016, uh, I have an amazing bait ball with all the predator and there is one cap for seal and this guy did a big mess and he was chasing all the predator and at the end there is only this guy. <laughs> but it was very interesting to, to see the behavior between the, the animals. Any specific camera settings you want to reveal secrets of how to shoot this? I mean, how do you actually I mean, you focus something like this? Yeah, for sure you need a high speed because it's very, very, very fast. Okay. Uh, you need also your ISO. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is, you know, every day the conditions are different. So you need to adjust in function of the visibility, the, the light. So, so you keep the ISO a little bit up so that your shutter speed can be a little bit faster? Yeah. Okay. How fast can your shutter speed actually go when you're using flash? When I use flash, I use uh, 1 to 150. 1 to 50. Okay, good. I think we have a few more uh, questions that we thought would actually fit into this kind of setting uh, that we received from uh, the community. And I would like the chance to ask a few, or if you need my help, I can also assist in I mean, you're you. shooting also, huh? <coughs> yeah. You were there, huh? Well, I, I mean, on this one, I actually broke my leg after one and a half weeks, and most of the stuff is filmed by Peter. So, there it yeah, is. Yeah, but she was there with yeah. the, the good action. Huh? Yeah. This is a super lucky guy. Eh? <laughs> yeah. Just need the right friends. Is there any advice how to get close to marine life except being calm and not to produce too many bubbles? Like, what is your strategy? Because I see you in Antarctica, I see you one and a half you hours. Mean, uh, in sitting, general? Yeah, in general. I see you sitting there waiting for something, and uh, you know everybody else would probably give up. Okay, there is patience, but. Yeah, you have to. I mean, it's a long process to. First, you have to, to learn about the species. About and the uh, animal. Uh, about the animal. Uh -huh. And what I really like in my job is to. Because I'm curious, and I really like the, to, to understand the <laughs> marine ecosystem. There is million of ecosystem in the world. And also what I like to document with my photograph is the behavior of the animal. So to document this, you need to learn how they work, how they live. You know, you need to understand the habitat and all this kind of thing. Uh, if I take an example, it's very easy. Like if you're doing macro, 
you know, there is this special shrimp living in this special habitat. And for white big animal, it's kind of the same, but it's more about how they move, how they uh, the predation, uh, all this kind of thing. And spending time with them, you can really anticipate. I think this is one of the keys, is to anticipate and keep going and try to really understand and try to make an interaction also with the animal. Yeah, to know your camera well and your gear well and your diving well and also know the surrounding well. And what? The surrounding, like you know, the environment. I think this is, oh, the, yeah, yeah, of course. is yeah. the key. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, you need to know your first your equipment. Huh? If you go scuba diving before taking photo, I think it's very important. And this is also why you need a good equipment. And you need to know your camera and uh, your sitting. You have to anticipate your sitting. Uh, me, I never took a course about photography. I just like uh, playing in the water. And this is how I learned underwater photography and photography. So. Okay, next question is from Sam. How do you best maintain focus while using wide angle shots with fast moving subjects? Okay, this is not too complicated. I use a fisheye, so it's a super wide angle. Um, I use flash as well, which is help. And uh, I have a super autofocus working very well. I use the Nikon D500 and very good. So with the fish eye, focusing is much easier. Yeah. In general. That yeah, is, I yeah, think, in general, uh, yeah. a key thing to uh, understand. Yeah, yeah, because it's very wide and. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and I mean, in videography, we basically do kind of the same. We try to close down the aperture as much as we can so that we don't have like a lot of uh, blur around. Yeah. And uh, pump up the ISO a little bit for that. And, and then also the aperture, the aperture as well yes. can help. Okay. Um, it's a very simple and easy question, but I thought Schalke Flow deserves an answer for that. Do objects appear smaller with a wide angle camera underwater? Yeah, of course. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> How would you photo or video set up differ, differ in photo photography big cetaceans to most animals you see when scuba diving, considering their size? And if they are close to the surface, and would you even need strobes? So yes. You uh, need strobes? Yeah, people think uh, because you are on the surface, you, you don't need strobes, which is right. But when I say to the sentinel, and if, you have, if you're front in the sun, and you have the animal, especially if you have a big animal, and when you're shooting, you just have the shadow, OK? So you need a flash just to put a little bit of flash. But what I want to say is I use flash, but I always use the minimum. You know, you can adjust the flash, and I just use the minimum, especially for this case, just to, to put some light, and you can see the details of the animal. Because if the sun is in, your f in front, it's too strong. So you need a flash to, to e mm -hmm. OK. When shooting wide angle without bright strobes, which setting or technique would you recommend to get as clear and crisp images as possible? From Sam. We actually understand this question. When shooting wide angle without bright strobes, which setting or techniques would you recommend to get a clear? OK. I think how do you actually lighten up the shot if you don't have a, have a strobe or anything? I think. Uh. The I use, uh, it, dep it depends what you want to do. You know, when you take a photo, uh, what I like is uh, I, I like to imagine how would be the photo. You know, you analyze the condition, you analyze the environment and say, OK, today this is very sunny and you have the light coming and you can see the ray. So maybe I will try to play with this and put the animal, you know, in the ray to make an ambience. So I will use the high speed to, to freeze the, the rays. So it's difficult to say, you know, every, every time you, you have to adjust your, your setting and your, because your creativity, you know? So it's difficult to say, but uh, I, have, I remember during the sergeant run, I took very nice photo like this uh, without flash about animals on the surface, especially when they come to check you, especially dolphin when they pass under you. 
Uh, this <coughs> is where I like to take photo without flash, uh, especially okay. for the rays. Mm -hmm. When shooting towards the sun, I know that it is common to have some aberration and reflection of the lens uh, in the shot because of the reflection of the dome port. Do you know this phenomenon? Like it's inside when you have like the reflection of the lens. Yeah, but uh, uh, I had a long time ago when I have a big one and now I'm using a, a smaller one and I have it, but not, any, not, not much not, of an not issue. Much, yeah. Okay, uh, we have this issue uh, sometimes, and what we do is uh, we basically cover everything inside of the lens with like black, soft material, so there is yeah. no uh, you know description of the lens or anything white that can uh, reflect. So the only thing that is reflecting is a little bit of the glass and uh, you know the things, and that's totally fine. I think that's a natural thing that can be uh, in the photo. Yeah, but so, some. Some cameras, some domes, uh, I mean, talk for, I, I'm using a Nochicam with a small dome, and there is, I don't need to do it. There is not so many things to cut because it's very compact, very small, so it's perfect. Okay. Um, in which cases it's possible to use the wide angle without strobes? Hmm. A lot of light and wide angle questions. When I mean, there is many opportunity. Uh, it, it's the same, it depends about your creativity, depends what you're doing. Uh, I take an example, when you go diving in the cenote, you know, uh, under the cave, uh, I hear many things. People say, no, you don't have to use flash. And I saw amazing photo with people using flash, you can see all the details on the place. And there is also people that say, no, we, we don't use flash. And you can see very nice picture with the rays, you know, in, in the middle of the cenote and this kind of thing. So for me, there is no... Yeah, there's even guys like uh, Guillaume, they never use a flash. Yeah, Guillaume, like, never, never use, use a flash. flash. So it's yeah. also depending on, on your style. Yeah, there is people, they like it, there is people, they don't like it. And uh, I know the freelight first, they prefer to dive without flash, which is because when you, c you start to put flash on your underwater, camera, your bigger, camera becomes like bigger and bigger and bigger. So it depends what you want to photograph as well. Lee wants to know, do you use any treatment on your lens domes to help water disperse quickly when trying to get split level shots? I think we Alex Mustard yesterday uh, revealed the secret about the potato. Okay. <laughs> do you have one? Yeah, no. Just the spit? Yeah, just the spit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like Clarify or Rain X, you know, the, the, the things that you put in your car window so that the, the, the water will go away. Did you ever try anything like that? No. No. Okay. I think also the potato is yeah, I mean, environmentally If you see my photo, I take a lot of yeah. uh, half and half picture and I don't use anything. Uh, it's just a technique to come, you know, you put it in the water and you have like a short period, like maybe one or two seconds where there is still water and it's not Oh, you away. actually use the water on the dome to make the photo? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But you need a short time, like one or two seconds. So, so you have the camera in the water and you go yeah, up and, and you then go you have up to like... Hmm. Okay. We'll Interesting uh, thing. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Um, Greg, thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. I think we're going to uh, be together here next... Saturday when we talk about the uh, Antarctica, Antarctica expedition. Uh, expedition, right? We have one question um, from a younger person uh -huh. um, who's asking what advice you would give someone, someone who's young, trying to get into becoming a professional photographer. I think the more important is to do what you like and to trust in your photograph. Um, when I start photography, when I start to say to the industry, I want to become a professional. Everybody was like, okay, try, but uh, there is no chance. It's very difficult and everything. And for me, what I remember is I was just keep going and do what I like. And I want to tell something else. It's about the, the photo. Uh, you know, photo, it's hard. And some people, maybe they like your photo. Some people, they don't like. And I think in photography, the more important is to like your photo, what you create, or you can see 
the ocean. Uh, photography is a means to express yourself. It is uh, uh, to communicate with the other, or you see, or you can, yeah. you know. So what I can say is go in the water, have fun, and take the photo, the one you want to take. And, and after the talent, we do the, the rest. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Anything else? No, I think that covers most okay. of it. OK, great. Perfect. So I would say, because it's the last live stream of today, and you got to catch a flight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Literally right uh, now. <laughs> we basically just play the video again and slide out of the live uh, show for today. And tomorrow is Macro Monday. <laughs> hey, I'm done. Yeah. Your yeah, special yeah. thing, yeah. Macro Monday. <laughs> Who's there tomorrow in the morning? <laughs> okay, do we have a program? Where is Sonia? Where is Sonia? Who's there tomorrow? Evan Sherman is here. Evan, the vape Sherman. <laughs> and uh, Evan even ha uh, brought a few new films, right? Like we have like, uh, you know, we do one premiere, you do like three premieres in mm -hmm. one session. Good or job, man. Thanks what do you want to do? Yeah, uh, but we talk about creative macro. Yeah. See you on, on Saturday. Uh, we, yep, great. We talk about creative macro lighting and shooting macro video with the guy who is a top guy in this field. Then I think Simon is also, Simon Buxton is there. We talk about black water photography. Yay! All the things that we do know nothing about so we can learn a lot. Macro Monday. Great. So tomorrow starting at 10.15 with the daily warm up and then 11.15, 2 o'clock and 3.30. Perfect. See you guys, and we play the video one more time, just because we can. <laughs>